praise the Lord. Amen. Can we all say Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, I, I want to thank you for such a good songs and leading songs. And sometimes we don't see it. What's behind the backdrop, the background? That there are a lot of personal preparing, running, getting ready, and allowed uh, that allowed me here to preach to you. And we want to say thank you for those who did the behind the scenes that allow me to minister to you today. Can we all say Amen? Praise the Lord. Um, today's sermon is. The preacher falls into the trap he warns about. That's my sermon title. Today, uh, I will be taking a story out from the Old Testament, and it's going to be in First Kings chapter thirteen. Now we. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to um, we're going to talk about the story, and because without a good context, we wouldn't be able to without a good context with, without a good context, we will we'll not be able to see it. Okay, I got you. Um, is it better now? Yes. Okay. Um, without a good context, we wouldn't be able to understand the story and learn some important lessons and applications. So these are the things that I'm going to do with you today. But before that, um, we have to understand the background uh, of First Kings, and these are the books that talk about kings. Nevertheless, understand. Who's the real king? Is okay, the king of all kings. Who do you think is the real king of all kings of the universe? God. God is the real king of all kings, and so we're going to study about how God plays a central role through the life of people in Israel and Judah. So the theme that runs behind is that God is in control. Could we say Amen to that? Amen. Praise the Lord. And before that, we're gonna sing. We're gonna sing an opening song uh, as our. We're gonna sing a song as our opening prayer because this is a song that we usually sing. Without it, we feel like something is off. So if you could follow me, please, everybody, stand up, and we're gonna sing. Open my eyes that I may see. Hymn three twenty six. Oh, open my eyes that I may see. Glimpses of truth that has for me place in my hands a wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God. Second verse. Open my ears that I may hear voices of truth that send us clear. And while the wave knows fall on my ear, everything falls will disappear. Silently now I wait. my mind. 
mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love with thy children thus to share. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, to let me see. Open my heart, alone in thee. Spirit of God. Amen. Have a seat. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful song. All right, as we enter to the story, this is the message of the man of God taken from 1 Kings chapter 13. And behold, a man of God went from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Um, I'm going to insert my commentary, as I understand, to give you the backdrop um, of the story. Here we see from chapter 13, verse 1, we, we are told there was a man of God. So if he was the man of God, so he must be sent by God. Although it doesn't say that, but we believe that. And he, he went from Judah to battle by the word of the Lord. Now understand the um, the ge geography uh, geography of uh, that place where Judah is in the southern border, and Bethel is part of the Israelite uh, Israel. There's the northern part. So what happened is that it's important that this man of God was sent from the south to the north to declare a message from the Lord. And at that time, it was just uh, after the death of Solomon. And what happened is that the kingdom of Solomon split into two parts. So you have the northern and then the southern. The northern was controlled by Jeroboam, and the southern was controlled by Rehoboam. And this man of God was sent from the southern, which is Rehoboam, to warn Jeroboam in verse 2. Then he cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and man's bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart, and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So in verse 2, we see um, here that the man of God did two things. First, he prophesied. By the name, by the name there's a, a, a child named Josiah will be born. Now understand this prophecy was not fulfilled until 300 years later, where they are about 18 kings apart from then to when Josiah was born to the Davidic kingship. So that prophecy took some time to, came, to come true, but we see there was an immediate response. In verse 3, it says, on the same day, a sign was given, and what happened is that the altar shall split apart and the ashes on it shall be poured out. In verse 4, So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in battle, that he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him! Then his hand which he stretched out toward him, withered, so that he could not pull it back to himself. 
So here we see that the miracle that the man of God sent by God performed a miracle. And we see he must be from the man of from from God because he was able to prophesy and immediate immediately it happened to King Jeroboam. So what happened is when King Jeroboam stretched out his hand, um, usually in the Bible, when God stretched out his hand to save the Israel in Exodus, it, it gives the impression that's a divine doing. So here, King Jeroboam stretched out his hand, appeared that his divine, but it is not so. And his hand withered, like dried up. You know, withered is like drying up like a piece of wood. Can you believe that your hand, as you stretch out, it turns into a piece of wood and then you wouldn't be able to put it down? So, although King Jeroboam is an evil king, but he's no fool, okay? He understood what will happen if he doesn't repent. So, right away, he pleaded. So in verse 5, the altar also was split apart and ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So understand here, when the altar split apart and the ashes poured out, there's a significance here in the story in that uh, for the altar, when they do sacrif sacrificials, uh, the ashes will... Um, will build up. So what they need to do is to take the ashes and take it away. They are, desi <coughs> they are designated area where they need to um, put their ashes. And in the case that the ashes pour out from the altar means that the altar was no longer in, no longer in good use, that they will not be able to do it. It rendered it useless. So here it's important that, that God gave a sign that the, uh, the altar is no longer good for use. Let's continue in verse 6. Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand be restored, you know. Right now, his hand is still up like that, you know. While I went there and come back, drink, take a, take a drink, his hand is still up in the air. Still, he couldn't withdraw. So the man of God, we see here, entreated the Lord, and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. So here, we see again that prophets, Prophets can do things other people cannot. They could pray for sinners and uh, restore him back to his original state. Verse 7, Then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. The king was so happy, right? Um, it happens that all the time when king is happy, they tend to want to reward somebody. And here, of course, uh, the man of God was sent with a purpose. This is not a business trip. So he is, um, this is not a business trip. So it's not an exchange. I do something for you, you return, I get paid. You know, that's what reward is. You're getting paid. So, and of God said to the king, if you were to give me half of your house, I would not go in with you, nor would I eat bread, nor drink water in this place. For so it was commanded me by the word of the Lord, saying, you shall not eat bread, nor drink water nor return by the same way you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way he came to battle. Now let me ask you a quick question. 
if the man of God was sent to do, um, was asked, was asked as commissioned by God to do things, uh, if he cannot eat and cannot drink, how long can he stay in that place? How long? Can you, can you do it for one day? Can you, can you don't eat and don't drink for a day? Oh, sure, I know some of you are very good in fasting. You know, you do extended water fasting, but that's water, right? You still drink water. So if you weren't able to do it for one day, meaning this person sent by God, he's not able to stay at that place very long, okay? There's reason for this, all right? Um, because what do you do when you sit down when, um, for, when you sit down having a potluck, you, what do you do? You build relationship, right? You're building relationship and you're forming friendships, which is what God don't want this man of God to do with uh, King Jeroboam because he's a good king, right? He's an evil king. He sinned against God. So this man was sent to give him a message. Now, here, um, here in verse 11, an old prophet dwelt in battle, and his sons came. This is the second portion of the uh, story. Now, an old prophet dwelt in battle, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in battle. They also told their father the words which he had um, Looks like Mike is dead. Testing. Battery's going out. Yep. Testing, testing. Okay, all right, let's continue. His sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that the day in battle. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. Verse 12. And their father said to them, Which way did he go? For his sons had seen which way the man of God went who came from Judah. Then he said to his sons, sons Saddle the donkey for me, so that so they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode on it, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. Then he said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am, All right, sitting on an, under the oak tree. Now, we see this old prophet, right? He dwelt in battle. Um, so we see that perhaps it, the story didn't tell us for what reason, you know, that caused him to come after the young man of God. We don't know. But we, um, we could guess, we could speculate that perhaps because he's also a prophet, um, he's interested that, who is this man of God? Is there another man of God? I need to go and know him. Uh, we, it's my colleague, right? It's, it's my colleague from the South. And we do the same thing. We preach the word. We are the messenger of God. So out of his own interest, he went after this man of God. So he found him. And, and verse 15, it says, Then he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he, so the old prophet is asking, is uh, giving an invitation, extending an invitation to this man, this young preacher, we call it, or the young messenger, the man of God, to come home with him to eat bread. And verse 16, um, he, meaning the man of God, the young preacher, the man of God, said, I cannot return with you, nor go in with you. Neither can I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place, for I've been told by the word of the Lord, you shall not eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by going the way you came. He said to him, so the old prophet said to the young prophet, I too 
am a prophet, as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. Now he was lying to him. Okay, he was de been deceiving. But this young prophet, this young man of God, without notice, without uh, having to suspect him, because he says, "I too am, I too am a prophet." So immediately he dropped his guard. You know, and what is better, right? You know, I've labored myself, taken myself, rode all the way to battle. Now I'm tired, I'm thirsty. What's better, you know, to, to, uh, to have something to eat and drink, you know, because it fits his, um, it's, it's also fits what he wanted. So he aqueous, he, he relented. To this old prophet, so he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. In verse 20, now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back, and he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, "Now, thus says the Lord." Because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the commandment which the Lord your God commanded you. But you came back, ate bread, and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. That's an indictment, okay? That's an indictment of being disobeying God's word. So it was after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled the donkey for him, the prophet whom he had brought back. So the old prophet, out of his own kindness, still, after he pronounced uh, the indictment from the word of the Lord, he still helped this young man of God, you know, uh, finish eating, finish drinking, and saddle him on his donkey and send him away, hoping that he may be well. When he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his corpse was thrown on the road, and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse. And there a man passed by and saw, saw the corpse thrown on the road, and the lion standing by the corpse. Then they went and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. Now when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has delivered him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to him. And he spoke to his sons, saying, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. Then he went and found his corpse thrown on the road, and the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse, nor torn the donkey. Then he laid the corpse in his own tomb, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. So it was after he had buried him that he spoke to his son, saying, When I'm dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones, for the saying which he cried out by the word of the Lord against the altar in battle and against all the shrines of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria, will surely come to pass. After this event, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but again he made praise from every class of people for the high places, 
whoever wished, he consecrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And this thing was the sin of the house of Jeroboam, and so as to exterminate and destroy it from the face of the earth. So Jeroboam continued to do evil in the sight of the Lord. <clears throat> now we could conclude and summarize um, this story into a few sections. Here, first one is there was a sign against battle from Judah. Okay, so we know um, God is in command, and God remember He played a central role in the life of the people in Israel and Judah, and sent a man of God to battle to King Jeroboam to give him a message, right? So this prophetic, this prophetic message is that God is not pleased with King Jeroboam and wanted him to stop doing it. And the second thing we could conclude is there was a voice came from battle it's a counter voice, all right? Uh, remember this. Uh, the man of God was sent from Judah to battle. So that is from the southern location to the northern location. And the north and the south, the, the reason they split was because um, they, couldn't, they couldn't see eye to eye. So now you have two uh, countries. You have two countries. They are always in the brink of going to war. And wars uh, always breaks out among them too. And we see that we see that this voice is coming from the north, right? So it's contradicting. And the third concluding summarize we can do is there was an obedient lion. The lion was obedient. Verse uh, the four concluding summarizes that a judgment was confirmed. Okay, so meaning that meaning that the word of the Lord first came to the man of God, right? So it confirms that he was sent by the Lord, and later because he didn't do um, he didn't do his mission right, so. Out from the old prophet, the judgment came to him, to him, who was sent to do a mission, and the judgment was confirmed. And the fifth concluding summarizing we can do is that prophecy came true. Can we say amen to that? The Lord gave prophecy in the Bible. Not only this, right? There are prophecies in the Bible, and all of them will come true. So, what are the lessons that we can take from this? First, <clears throat> the old prophet of battle played a trick on the man of God, and he claimed that God had spoken to him and countered God's earlier instructions. That's nonsense. Say nonsense. Say nonsense. nonsense. Yes, it's a nonsense. This man of God, um, this old prophet, you know, who's known, also known as man of God, you know, he's a preacher. He's a messenger in battle, but he played on a trick. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go, I've read some commentary and say, you know, this, you know, certainly his deceiving way is questionable, you know. We could, care, uh, we could, we could, we could question his character has not been a good man, okay. And that's it, you know. Um, it wasn't an instruction from the Lord, you know. It was just out of his own heart. Um, maybe out of in interest that he wanted to know. It's like, that's my colleague from the southern, uh, southern, low, low, from the southern a country. Now I want to get to know him. Like, you know, is it how strong, or how faithful he, is he? So he's, maybe he played a little trick, you know. But we know that we know that he, he did tell a lie, right? He deceived him. So that's nonsense, right? Don't do that. If, um, I, I know a lot of 
us are adult, but sometimes, you know, we do foolish things, right? Um, especially in church setting. Don't do that, right? Don't do foolish things. Second lessons we could learn is that discerning the true word of God sometimes can be difficult, as it is in this case, right? So we can ask, how do you discern the true word of God? So what should he do? Like, what should this man of God do? Any? Anybody? Should he ask God, right? Yeah? Should he ask God? Should he pray? Right? It's a man of God. Shouldn't you be on your knee praying? Right? He did not. And because he heard an old prophet who claimed that he's too an old prophet, he dropped his guard. Right? And then, and then when, when the message was something that uh, soothed his heart because he was hungry, he was thirsty, and he wanted that as well, so he agree with it. So as sad as it is, it is what it is. So we should ask the question, how do we discern the true word of God? So think of this, right? Think of Adam and Eve, how they were been deceived by the old serpent. Remember that? That's the first story, right? And um, should Eve, well, first Eve shouldn't be by herself. Secondly, maybe she, she should have went to consult Adam and maybe perhaps ask God, pray, right? So how do we know it's the voice of God, right? As this man of God was deceived, it's very hard during that time. So what I would say is that, sure, you understand that the mission, you know, the commission of the mission was sent by, uh, was from God to the man of God, sent from Judah to battle to give King Jeroboam a message. So what he should have done is because he received the message directly from God, he should have went and asked God if the old prophet was telling the truth, right? which he did not. So a lot of times, we should go directly to the person who gave us the message to confirm that if that is from them, right? That's the smart thing to do. Another example is that, remember Abraham Isaac? Uh, Abraham was directed to take Isaac and sacrifice him on the altar. A test of the faith of Abraham to see if he could follow through the word of the Lord. But at the very last moment, as he was raising up his knife, what happened? There was a voice coming, right? Telling him, stop, stop, don't do that. You know, it was just a test. So without the direct voice from the message from the message from the uh from the initial messenger then we should not we should not disobey the word of the lord because in the example of abraham and isaac that god directly speak right to counter the first instructions and says no it was a test abraham don't 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 put your knife on the little boy it was just a test so that message should come directly from the Lord. And third lessons, the third lesson we can learn from here is that there is a need of absolute obedience to God. Can we say amen? Yes. From this story, we see that there's a need of absolute obedience to God. And it is important. And if we fail to do that, sometimes the end result is death. And we see, we see that we see that uh, the man of God died, but 
some that could be a sign actually that could be we may ask like why why did he die right that could be a sign to king jeroboam to show him that if you do not listen to the word of god this could be your ending right that could be ending so in terms for king jeroboam um, there's a story playing out in front of him and that's a straight warning to him to know that the Lord is not playing around. The fourth lesson we can learn here is that the story shows that prophecy is irrevocable. So from out of the word, the word out of the out from the word of the word when when the word comes from the Lord is irrevocable and prophes just as prophecy as it is. Lesson five, we can also, we learn, we learn that Jeroboam had not learned anything. And he continues in his own ways of doing evil. That's in verse uh, 33, we saw that. And lesson six is God wants his people to worship him his way. Can we say amen? Yeah. And it's very specific. Now, understand the backdrop. So, the reason that King Jeroboam built an altar in battle is that after the split of the kingdom of the northern and the southern, he didn't want his people to go to Jerusalem, which is the southern border, to do worship. So, he, that's why he set up another altar at battle without the approval and instruction of the Lord. He did it by himself, right? The reason is he knows if the people went back to Jerusalem to worship, which is the designated area, it's the central area where they, the only area where they do worship, the people will, will eventually go back to the southern border, right? And his kingdom will end. His kingdom will not last. So therefore, to prevent his kingdom from falling apart, he built an altar in a battle and told the people, yes, you can worship here. You don't have to travel down to, south, to our southern border to worship. So, there is a way, there, there is a place, okay? There is a place to do worship. And we here we learn that there's also a way to do worship. And that is important, right? When do you worship the Lord? What day do you worship? Do you worship on Saturday, seventh day Sabbath, or do you worship, you take your Sabbath on Sunday, right? That is important. So keep in mind which day to worship, when to worship is important. Um, an example for that is uh, Cain and Abel. Remember that? And Cain wanted to worship the Lord. In his way, in his way. And Abel was able to listen to the instruction of the Lord and do his sacrifice right, with the lamb, with the sheep. But Cain wanted to do fruits. You know, he, he's probably a vegetarian, a vegan, right, like Adventist with a veggie burger in his breath. You know, he's like, let's worship the Lord with our fruits from our garden. Uh -uh. That's a very specific way the Lord wants us to worship Him. And there's no other way. Uh, lesson, lesson number seven, take care when following God's instructions. We must take careful reading and understanding of God's instructions so that we don't, lead, uh, so that we don't end up like this tragic story. Um, let's take some applications. Uh, from this story. First, of course, is idolatry in the background. The theme of that in the background is idolatry, where King Jeroboam uh, went to make a place to an uh, altar to worship where he's not supposed to, right? Idolatry means, what, what is idolatry? Idolatry, it could be anything that you put before God, okay? 
So anything that's put before God is, can be said as idolatry. So another form of idolatry committed by this young prophet is that uh, this uh, young man of God, this young preacher, this young messenger, is that he allowed himself to yield to another, right? So this is like spiritual idolatry, even though he's not physically formed. It's not like, you know, it's not like today the idolatry you think about like gold or uh, stones or rocks, uh, uh, idol. Where, or, or, or now in the modern day, it will be idolatry as house, right? Let's buy a big house before the Lord. Uh, let's earn a lot of money before we come to the Lord. And all the things we put before the Lord, that's idolatry. Here, spiritually, the man of God is committed, com- committed, has committed idolatry. It's not a form, right? He put, he put the word, he put the word of the old prophet before God, right? It's a form of idolatry, spiritual idolatry. He listened, he listened to the old prophet before he went to ask God. You know, God has instructions for him to, uh, to, to do exactly what he was told. But he listened, he yielded to the old prophet. And that's a form of spiritual idolatry. Now, you may ask the question, was God too harsh on him? Was it? Well, some of you say yes. Yes, it's very sad in this story that, you know, he lost his life. He was, he was being sent by God, but yet, you know, he became a casualty. The preacher, the messenger became a casualty. The preacher falls into the trap that he was warning another about, you know. And here we can, as Adventists, we're called by God to preach the three angels' message, but we can still miss the heaven. Just like this guy, man of God, is sad, you know. All of us, you know, I know, all of us, not all of us are called to a royal priesthood, but in a generalized way, we are called to discipleship. We are called to follow Christ, to preach His word. So in a small way, all of us are preachers. Uh, our, our, all of us have carried the messenger as message. message. We are all messenger carrying the three angels' message, right? But if we don't listen to God and pay careful attention to his instructions, we can still miss heaven. And then the last thing, application here, we see an obedient lion, a lion that obey the word of the Lord. Wow. You know what the lion did not do? The lion did not eat the man he killed, right? The man of God was instructed, the man of God. Oh no, wait. The man of God. He was instructed not to eat. And he ate. The lion was instructed not to eat. And the lion obeyed. Wow. That's something we can learn from animal, right? Praise the Lord. Even the beasts of the field listen and obey the Lord. It is the model we can learn from. And here, um, my ending remarks is that Karl Barth is known as a, he's a famous 20th century, uh, century theologian. He says uh, from this story, it can only be, but the word of our God endureth forever. He may well be said that this is, in fact, the beginning and end and sum and substance of this story, that the word of God endures through every human standing and falling, falling and standing on the left hand and on the right. So praise the Lord, his word and God endureth forever. And I say, this is the story, the lesson from the king of all kings, how God plays a central role to the life of people in Israel and Judah and continues still into our life today and will be tomorrow. Amen. If you understand and the message today and you're willing to observe 
the commandments of the Lord as we carry our three angels' message to the world and preach and to finish the work, may you be obedient to and be steadfast to the word and his commandments.